Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to thank uh, Illumina and uh, for inviting me to come speak, and also um, the other speakers that are here today. So, I'm not. I don't think I'm that funny. I'm just you know maybe goofy. I'm not sure what it is. But um, so today I want to describe uh, a lot of the work that we've published in the last nine months, and some uh, a very recent work that we've just finished, uh, dealing a lot with tumor evolution as well as understanding tumors more from a uh, more complex integrated molecular portrait, as we all like to say. So. I'm going to describe this today. Um, also, I, I will warn you, I do talk very fast. Uh, so, but don't worry, I'll have the slides be available uh, after the talk. All the slides will be posted on the website. So I'm going to describe today, uh, basically, in seven parts, what we've been doing in looking at tumor complexity. So first, a bit of background. As most of you know, the central dogma of molecular biology is posited in 1958 by Francis Crick, made things fairly simple. You had DNA, RNA, protein. It was a pretty straightforward story. Of course, this has gotten more complicated as the years have gone on. I'm going to start today with a bit of discussion about the epigenome. So of course, the epigenome is what regulates and allows cells to specify to become all the different types of cells in your body. It's also dysregulated in cancers, uh, which I'll talk about today. And of course, it underlies gene expression and interacts a lot with other molecules I'll tell you about today. So the epigenome, of course, uh, you can draw like a methyl group like this. On DNA methylation, you can draw it a number of different ways. Uh, it was discovered in 1925 that there was methyl cytosine, but it was interesting. It took basically decades and decades later until we could really start to visualize in cells what methyl cytosine was doing. And it's notable that on day one, it's very important. Immediately after fertilization, the paternal genome gets stripped away of a lot of its methyl marks and gets reprogrammed, gets reset. And this has to happen in cells of normal development. As you can see here from a paper from 2000, this work was recapitulated in 2010, or 2012 last year, where you can actually see on a per base resolution that the paternal genome slowly gets it's demethylated reset, and then after you become part of the inner cell mass, you start to specify all of the trillions of types of cells that are in your body today. So this resetting is essential, and if things go wrong, well, things uh, get bad. So the hallmark of cancer is also, or one of the hallmarks of cancer is also uh, perturbed methylation, especially in hematological malignancies. And the simple diagram here just shows you can, in a simple concept, you get more methylation, more methylation, genes get turned off, and then eventually you'll get cancer or metastasis. Uh, but again, when you start to look closer and look at base resolution, we know that the story is more complicated than just genes being on and off and oncogenes being turned on and off. We can see in some cases, a paper from 2011 showing that normal tissues actually show uh, across the genes, you can look at CPG islands, which are areas of the genome that have high CG density, CPG density. Uh, you can see, for example, that generally you have demethylation there, but in tumors nearby, you can have these variable regions, this sort of methylation drift, which I'll talk about today as well and expand upon this idea, so that this sort of perturbed methylation is something that's important in cancer development as well as its evolution. So a lot of this work has prompted large-scale efforts like the ep epigenome roadmap, which is sequencing genetic and epigenetic and transcriptional activity of all sorts of normal tissues, embryonic stem cells, induced pluripotent stem cells. Almost any tissue you'd want to sequence, um, you should check here first because it might be being done already. So don't do it necessarily in your lab because it might be done in the next 6 to 12 months through the roadmap or through ENCODE projects. Also, there's the EU, European Union's Blueprint Project, which is um, you know, working along similar lines of trying to really understand what's the complexity of the epigenome. So a lot of these data sets and work in our lab have prompted us, uh, prompted us to develop tools to start to examine these types of uh, changes in tumors. One in particular I'll talk about today is Methyl Kit, uh, which is a package that we've published to basically start to tease out some of the changes of DNA methylation. It's worth noting, we did consider for a little while calling this Meth Lab, but then we started doing Google searches and we realized that that would be not good. Uh, the people with missing teeth, there's a lot of problems. So we went with methyl kit is what we ended up doing. So we applied these methods to uh, acute myeloid leukemia and uh, published some of this work just late, late last summer of looking at what is the DNA, DNA methylation landscape of different subtypes of leukemia, looking at uh, leukemia with MLL fusion and some with mutations in a gene uh, called IDH. So uh, historically, RRBS has reduced representation by sulfite sequencing which allows you to actually gauge on a per base level what is the percent methylation. And again, this is small, I know from the back, and slides will be available afterward, but essentially, if you have a methylated cytosine, and when you treat with bisulfite, you will not have a deamination reaction occur. So what that means is that instead of being converted to a uracil, you'll stay as a cytosine, but actually, if you do PCR, your U's become T's, and you can calculate on a per base level what percent methylation do you have by just counting number of C's and number of T's, essentially per base. But we've modified this method slightly by changing some of the chemistry and changing the treatment of bisulfite, and also changing the way we do fragment pooling, which is all detailed in this paper, to try and improve it. What we published is that we can actually get a lot more CPGs covered. We're using the same depth of sequencing, but just changing the library prep. We improved the number of covered CPGs. We've also improved on all the types of features that you would like to measure in the genome. We improved coverage both in CPG islands as well as in exons, introns, promoters, 
and CPG shores. And CPG shores, if you don't know, are just basically, you have the CPG island, which is CPG rich, and then you have the sort of shore next to it, which is defined in papers usually as the one or two KB next to the island of the CPG. And there's some talk about CPG swamps or CPG other areas of the genome. I won't talk about those. Those are more debated in the literature. Um, but again, that's just showing that we have more uniquely aligning reads and covered more areas of the, of the genome. So what we looked at, the most shocking figure, or one of the more shocking figures we looked at is we just said, okay, what does the global landscape look like, say, of, of the IDH tumors here versus the MLL here? And we can see that one subset of tumors, the IDH in particular, had global hypermethylation, whereas the MLL uh, fusion cancers had global hypomethylation, so globally turned down. Of course, there's exception to this, but you can see across all chromosomes, you can look up is where you see hypermethylation, and down is where you see hypomethylation. We can see that they're very distinct subtypes uh, on an epigenetic level, whereas genetically they only differ by essentially a set of a few mutations, and one has a, essentially an MLL fusion gene. So very slight genetic change for a dramatic epigenetic change is what we observed. More interestingly, they were not the same sites uh, that were actually um, showing these differences. So there was a little bit of overlap, but for the vast majority of sites, we could see here tens of thousands of differentially methylated cytosines, or DMCs, places that change significantly we actually could observe that they don't really overlap that much. If you just add up all the bases where we see any potential change in one set of tumors versus the other, we can see that there are some cases where you see green and green or pink and pink where they consistently are hypomethylated relative to normal bone marrow or hypermethylated in pink. But for the vast majority of places, actually, they're very distinct. You have hypermethylation in one tumor type and no change at all for, say, MLL or IDH. So they're you know, very dramatically different subtypes are revealed in these cancers. And more interestingly to me, because I'm obsessed with non-coding areas of the genome, is that there, a lot of the action, a lot of the DMCs were actually not present just in promoters or just in exons. They're in intergenic regions. They're in introns. They're in places far away from the TSS and all over the, all over the entire genome. So we actually observed that of the, of the percentage of features that have DMCs or differentially methylated cytosines, we can see that in some cases for IDH, we see a lot of activity in promoters, as you would you know, canonically think about methylation and gene regulation. But we also see in MLL cancers, uh, essentially that there's a lot more activity actually in the introns than you'll see in other areas uh, of the genome. So actually that where the activity is occurring is also tumor specific. And if you'll um, you know, remember the old idea of expression and methylation is that if you hypermethylate, you turn a gene off. If it's hypomethylated, the gene gets turned on. But some work that's already been published has you know, clearly demonstrated that it's, it's not just yes or no. You do for sure see a thumbprint uh, of methylation that happens for the high expressed genes. You see, so essentially, this is a regulatory finger saying, this is exactly where a transcriptional start site begins. I want to start this expression for high, methyl for high expressed genes. You do see that hypomethylation, that drop to 0% methylation right there. But then in the gene body, we actually can see, essentially, hypermethylation. You generally see high methylation indicating that this gene should stay expressed. So there's this heterogeneity spatially of where we see methylation and gene expression. So we also looked in the tumors to say, does this trend uh, you know, basically persist in our samples? And we could observe that uh, it's a complicated plot, so bear with me, but essentially we look just first what at the CPG island, then look at the five prime and three prime shore, and look essentially at high express genes or low express genes that either have uh, low and high methylation or that are you know, high express genes with the inverse, higher low methylation. And we could see, as you'd expect, essentially when you have essentially high express genes in red, you'll see you know, hypermethylation, or you'll see this, this, this thumbprint where you see this uh, hypomethylation that says turn this gene on, and some uh, very little, not, not always changes in the shores of, of the TSS, the transcriptional start site. And when we look 5KB upstream, we can see again that basically right at the CPG island, there is a fair amount of activity, and occasionally you'll see a statistical association in the tumor subtypes of what's controlling gene expression. But what's really surprising is in the gene body, as you can tell for normal tissues, you actually just generally would see everything hypermethylated. You'll see a lot of high methylation. But we can see that it's different between the tumor types, that how gene expression itself is regulated depends on whether you're an IDH mutant or an MLL mutant because of the way the, way the methylation is basically perpetuated between these two tumor states. So again, just showing that it's not just uh, where the methylation is occurring, but it's, it's actually how it's controlling gene expression. We you know, showed here that it seems to be very strongly different and associated with how it's actually manifesting in the transcriptome. So, uh, another note is that where we see this methylation, as I alluded to, is sometimes in different distances. It could be 10 kb or 5 kb or hundreds of kb away. We found that actually, again, the MLLs are distinct because they actually have the, the changes, these DMCs, are usually 11 kb, whereas in the IDH they're 5 kb or 6 kb away. So they, even the geography of methylation itself became a phenotype. And this, this really underscores the fact that, you know, when we, and, you know, really almost 40 years ago, we decided to fight cancer with the NCI and Nixon signed this bill. We'd fight a, we decided to have a war on cancer, but really the, the, the point should be we should have a war on cancerers 
because each one of them has their different subtypes, and this is one of Tanya's bad jokes she's alluding to. She's seen this before. So um, every cancer itself really has a very distinct subtype where you have slight genetic changes and you have very clear and broad epigenetic changes that we need to keep in mind. And I'm sure most of you have been studying heterogeneity or tumor subtypes. This isn't news to you, but uh, again, we need to think about the war on cancer, as I'd say. So this led us to start to think a little bit more in the last uh, six months about better methods for not just looking at single base changes, but regional changes to look at, say, neighborhoods of epigenome changes. So again, if you think of a single differentially methylated cytosine here, you can just say, okay, some one thing changed, but we want to try and aggregate these, uh, these uh, changes, these differentially methylated cytosines into regional analysis. So what we've done is start to, you know, just to refresh your memory again, is we, we want to look for these. We want to actually try and see where these regional changes, these, uh, these hypervariable regions. So, We've developed, and there's a tool coming out in about uh, four or five weeks that is called EDMR, so basically empirical differentially methylated regions. So we just want to actually try and define methylation differences uh, by regional analysis, which also helps us find hypervariable regions uh, in, in different tumor samples. So uh, I'm going I'm to dive a little bit into the math and to talk about the algorithm uh, and go quickly through it, though. I don't want to dwell too much on it, but basically uh, we fit a bimodal distribution to the tr transform distance of where these CPGs are changing and then build a weighted cost function, determine the regions, and then adjust uh, for uh, multiple testing and call these regions. So essentially, we uh, tested a lot of our data on looking at, you know, you know, you can have thresholds for how much coverage you have across the genome. You always have to threshold for that. You want to have at least a certain set of normal samples that carry some of this, essentially, this signal. And we do uh, a lot of Fisher's exact tests and adjusting p-values. Um, and I'll talk about more details of this shortly. And also, you can adjust how much you want to have a methylation difference. There is, of course, this constant battle between statisticians who want a statistical difference and people looking at the biology who want a biologically meaningful difference. And so you need to really have cutoffs for both whenever you're defining some kind of tool, and we do so here as well. So CPGs, when you look across the genome, are very heterogeneous. They're not, they're not randomly distributed. You'll see sometimes they'll clump together, say like oatmeal in a cereal, sometimes they're far away. And so we actually found, what is the distribution of normal CPGs? They actually look like this. So you'll see a lot of them are generally pretty close and some that are in this longer tail. So we actually fit uh, a bimodal distribution of this that fit very closely actually to what the data look like. So this is sort of the average distance of different CPGs genome-wide. And we use this to find empirically determined DMR regions. So, so we can see there's, there's really two distributions here. So we wanted to basically take these, separate them out, and say, what's the sort of weighted sum of penalty? Like, if I call this a, a close CPG versus far, what's the odds that I'll be wrong, essentially? So if you zoom in, essentially, to this area, we broke this up into a cost function to see what are the odds of being in this, in this distribution, this other distribution, and have a weighted sum of whether you're in the right distribution. And what we found is actually there's a pretty neat spot in which you can just put an empirically based threshold of where you break off regions across the genome. Uh, when you see the, what is the sort of the knee of this curve, this is the sort of lower point of the weighted cost function, which is what we pick for the DMRs. So the differentially methylated regions are defined by this. And so, of course, you need to do some, you can do filtering. This is established in the tool as well. And you also want to have a Stouffer lip tech test, which is there's a bunch of corrections for multiple testing. Another version of this is uh, Fisher's combined p-value, but this one does not assume normality for those statistically inclined in the room. And also, we have to correct for the false discovery rate. So after doing all these things, we tried this on a lot of different samples, some of the ones I've just talked about. And we see that the di distribution across many normal and tumor types is almost always bimodal, almost always very similar. So we uh, wanted to then go back to the data I just described and see, can we recapitulate on a regional level the same things that we saw on a base-specific level? And the short answer is essentially that the model looked like the same. And we actually could see very similar things. The IDH samples have global hypermethylation. The MLL samples have global hypomethylation, which isn't too surprising because we're using data that should show this. But it was just good to see that regionally we see basically five to 6,000 regions that shift all at once with each other. So that we can go to a regional analysis. And the other interesting thing we found is that the, what, it's a new phenotype that emerges when you start to look at what's changing on a regional level within exons or genes. We can see that the IDH is actually, their DMRs, their methylated regions, have sort of pulsed out or flexed. We're in the middle of in the lab of debating what's the best verb for this, but you can call it pulsing or flexing or you know, creeping. There's a number of words you could use, but essentially the IDH tumors have, have basically expanded out their methylation regions, and much more significantly so than in the ML uh, samples, and all these much more so than what we see with normal bone marrow. So this gives us a new phenotype that we've really just been looking at in the last uh, few months and trying to understand what does this mean when the methylation sort of creeps out, and also what's controlling that, obviously, is the next, the next question. So, and I'm going to switch gears a little bit to talking a little bit more dis discreetly about tumor evolution. 
uh, in this case, looking at the transcriptome data. So we love transcriptome data. We say love equals RNA-seq, mainly because uh, the data is extremely, extremely rich. So you take sequencing data, you'll get reads. You, with these reads, you can do a, a great deal of work with alignments. You can look at, you basically can get some single base resolution work on your BAMs. From this, you can also get um, you know, genetic variation. You can look at single nucleotide changes, indel CNVs. You can look at differential expression by base, by gene, by exon, by isoform, and by transcript. You can also look at non-coding RNAs and new genes. You can also look at gene fusion, some of which we've validated. Uh, and also, whatever's left over, you always get to see what else was growing in and on your tumor, essentially. So you, uh, the, the, the data is extremely rich. So uh, as, as normally, we like to have some tools that we make or use. In this case, we have one called RMIC, which you can download. It's an open source tool that goes from raw reads to BAM files and then generally starts to generate summary statistics, call mutations, look at differential expression, also do fusion and, and new transcript discovery and then also do a lot of visualization tools, so it's under review right now. So we wanted to use these tools, essentially, to look at uh, resistant clones uh, in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Uh, it's a collaboration uh, with William Carroll at NYU. So we had a lot of, pay this was actually a discussion back in 2009. We said, well, what do we want to do? Do we want to do exome or RNA-seq? We're at that critical junction. Well, what should we do? Is it, you know, is it exome? They're about, you know, maybe similar price, but, you know, which one would be, give us better bang for the buck? And the, the, the usual argument is like, well, if you think about it, RNA-seq means that the variants are expressed, so they might be more actually biologically meaningful. Exome will tell you it's a little bit easier. The variant calling is a little bit easier. We ended up going with RNA-seq and doing about 100 million reads per sample with the goal to find both fusions and relapse-specific mutations, and the idea being if it was actually expressed in a nonsense mutation, it might be more biologically meaningful. Uh, and we were lucky in the sense that we found some good things. So just from 10 patients, uh, we did confirm this fusion that was present uh, essentially in uh, this patient. We, didn't, we had some predicted other potential fusions, uh, but we didn't, uh, none, none of them actually had validated. So calling fusions is still a bit of a messy work in RNA sequencing, but um, if it's mainly because you have to hope that your fusion transcript is very highly expressed, which it, it not always is. Uh, but we did at least confirm this one. And we wanted to look in these patients. And the most striking thing about doing paired analysis of, of looking at tumors, so you take the same patient at one time point versus another, is it really seems to be an almost endless ocean, I'd say, of private mutations. Almost everyone's got their own little, little small world of mutants that they're carrying around with them, which has been somewhat borne out by the Thousand Genomes Project as well. But you can say what there's in this plot is you look at the paired sample. So each one of these sort of uh, columns is the same patient at diagnosis and relapse. And in, here in the colors, whether you see blue is homozygous reference. So this is the percent, it's a heat map showing the percent of non-reference allele. So if you're all blue, you're just the same as the reference genome. If you start to get creep out into sort of the uh, whiter or yellow area, you're about 50% uh, of a non-reference allele, or really you could say a heterozygote. And if you see red, that means you're homozygous non-reference, that you're completely uh, a homozygous mutant. So, but you can see there's a shifting of these colors, and rarely did we actually find something that was very consistently appearing across all patients, again, leading this idea of a uh, you know, more rare variant common disease hypothesis. Uh, but that there's this shift over time of what you'll detect, both of what's present and also what's expressed of these non-reference or just mutation, uh, mut mutated alleles in these patients. And so, but, you know, generally we did observe though that most mutations would follow this diagnosis. So if you look at one, the collection of patients, what's essentially uh, at diagnosis versus relapse, you could actually see that uh, most, if you just count the alleles, the number of non-reference alleles, they're usually about the same. They kind of follow this diagonal. But you will see over here, essentially, different uh, clones that were particular to diagnosis or relapse. In particular, if you do some filtering, we could find these essentially would be sort of the sensitive clones, and these would represent chemo-resistant clones, things that emerge after chemotherapy that then appeared in the patients. And so what we did is started to do a lot of filtering, get rid of dbSNP, get rid of 1,000 genomes, get rid of anything that may have been seen before, uh, started to try and do some validation. We got down to 55 non-synonymous variants. You know, this is like a kind of a Tim Lay standard kind of graph of let's do the sorting. Um, and essentially, we got down to, you know, 20 relapse-specific mutations. We had some that when we went back to germline, we realized there, was actually st there actually was mutation in germline, so we say no relapse-specific mutation, and some just the PCR failed, and some we just didn't have actually germline to confirm. So there is, you know, always a, the challenge, actually, of trying to find something that's truly relapse-specific that had no evidence in the constitutional DNA is a little bit hard. But we got down to these 20 specific relapse uh, mutations. We found that the TITV ratio is about 1.2, so we're seeing a pretty low TITV ratio, much lower than genome or exome data that you'll see, uh, which is just a little bit surprising as a, a phenotype. Confirmed a lot of them by Sanger. So again, you can see a germline uh, diagnosis and relapse. You can see essentially, uh, we can start to see this emergence of this resistant clone that's not present at all at germline or diagnosis. Validated all these mutations by Sanger, and I'm looking forward to the day when that no longer happens, because uh, it takes forever, and we'll do, uh, hopefully, you know, true seek panels or something in the future. 
But for now, we do this, and this is still the gold standard. Um, so we validated them, and then we wanted to see, well, what do we see for these? Where, where are the mutations accumulating? What do we see that's mutated that's a, a chemoresistant clone? Is there a sign for chemoresistance? And we actually found that one of the clinically associated features was the time to relapse. In fact, it was the only thing that was actually associated uh, with some of the mutations we saw that were occurring in seven out of the 10 patients we looked at in NT5C2. And if you looked at other, other you know, patients that didn't have mutations in this gene, they really indicated a strong uh, increase of that they would relapse faster. So this led us to believe that these clones might not only just be associated with relapse specific, a specific state, but they may actually drive the, the cancer to come uh, to relapse faster. And uh, indeed, we show that there's some evidence for that. So when we looked actually at what is NT5C2, we actually, we actually saw what I like to call functional mutation clustering. There's no uh, real word for this yet, but this is what I'm gonna call it. So where all the mutations occurred was nearly in the same spot of the gene. So if you take the gene writ large, it looks like there's mutations showing up all over the place. These are uh, missensory nonsense mutations. But when you actually fold the protein together, you can see they're starting to emerge at the exact same spot, which is a binding pocket uh, for some of the chemotherapy drugs. And indeed, when we actually tried to do uh, purine nucleoside analog treatments in cell culture, basically doing transiently lentivirus infected cells with control, and then we take all these different, we took all the different missense mutations. We can see essentially they were resisting apoptosis by these drugs. So they were not only leading to faster relapse, they were leading to faster relapse because they were these mutations were driving them to resist the apoptosis that was induced by these drugs. We actually were able to show this uh, in, in culture. And more interestingly, I think, is that we could see that these clones, we did then some PCR and sequence very, very deep in these patients. We could see that a diagnosis at even 25,000x or 50,000x, that there was usually zero evidence or sometimes very scant evidence uh, of this clone present at diagnosis, but then suddenly would emerge to be 50%, 25% of the cells at relapse. And so what's interesting is that some, some points that we could see just a little bit of evidence that the cell is there, and as soon as you do chemotherapy, you basically create this perfect selection pressure to have them emerge. And we know, we think we've you know, published here some of the, the mutations that confer this sort of chemo resistance uh, on ALL. So I'm gonna switch gears to uh, talking a bit about something that's also new is the epitranscriptome. I also confess I made this word up, but I like this word. Um, getting back to the methyl groups uh, is that, you know, we, you know, the four base pair genome is just the beginning. So this is starting to get into more of a what else is out there kind of part of the talk towards the last, last part of the talk. And we know that, you know, there's basically uh, methylcytosine, hydroxymethylcytosine, nature calls this the sixth base, and this is the fifth base. But there's formal cytosine, carboxyl cytosine, there's many variations of the genetic code that have been demonstrated. And there's also a lot of RNA modifications that are present as well. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about these. So methylation is important for both, for both development, as we published in, in mouse uh, last year, as well as in human. And we could also, what we've observed is that, you know, these, these methyl-6 marks, these RNA methylation changes, we can see them a lot in cancer cell lines and that we've seen that they do change dynamically. There's some, since this is all being videotaped and uh, I'm not presenting a lot of very, very new data, but we do know that it's changing in cancer cell lines and are looking at this further. Uh, with this method that we call MIRIP-seq, and so it's basically methylated RNA IP, and then you sequence. So you basically take all your RNAs. If you have methyl marks, you pull them down, and then you'll actually pull them down on beads, and you elute RNA, and at that point, you just have fragmented RNA. So you can make cDNA, sequence it, and you call peaks kind of like you would with chip seq data, and you can see where are these methyl marks across the genome. And we have some uh, uh, software that helps do the analysis as well, me Ripper. This is a uh, student in the lab who likes Jack the Ripper, so this is his thing. Um, and so we like to call it sort of the birth of the epitranscriptome, which is a, you know, this new realm of RNA regulation that we've been looking at. And it's notable that methyl-6 adenosine in RNA is only one out of 107 known RNA modifications as published from the RNA modification database. Uh, and other groups have started to look at some of these RNA demethylases or RNA methylases, and we've seen that they actually impact uh, metabolism as well as MOS fertility. And notably, what they've kind of published is that you'll see, you know, a dis dysregulation of epigenetic modifiers when you change RNA methylation, which is very striking because it indicates there's some connection between genetics and the epigenetics and RNA epigenetics as well, or epitranscriptomics. And so I would posit to you that there's many potential functions for M6A, including preventing RNA editing as well as altering stability of mRNAs and then impacting with the epigenome. So if we went back to the revised, essentially, do central dogma, I would say it might look like this. Now there's this, essentially, we have no other RNAs that guide this process, the information can flow back on itself. We have reverse transcription, we have RNA binding proteins that can edit the RNAs after they've been post-transcriptionally made. Uh, you also then, of course, have ribosomes, which can copy themselves. I always want to comment how creepy prions are because they can copy themselves and move between species even. And then you have the epigenome, which is this beautiful regulatory layer underlying the DNA and all the histones, as well as the RNA modifications. Again, there's at least 107 known RNA modifications. And post-translational modifications that represent all the changes you can do to proteins. 
Uh, and essentially then we know that DNA and epigenetic marks can be heritable. There's been some evidence that RNA uh, interactions can, and viral induced microRNA response is also heritable. And there's many, many other types of RNAs uh, actually running around your cells. And of course, prions can go between species and also people. And I think you know, there's some evidence now building in the literature and from our own work that there's this interplay between the epigenome and epitranscriptome or RNA and DNA modifications uh, that we've looked at. So I guess in the last five minutes or so, I'm gonna make a quick commentary about a thought experiment. I think I have maybe five minutes here, um, or a little bit more. So we've been getting lots of you know, genomes and transcriptomes and epigenomes, and we've been playing a lot with lots of huge amounts of data. So I just wanna uh, you know, briefly describe some of the challenges that are waiting for all of us essentially. And so this is a picture of what in theory the entire universe looks like right now. So when I think about space, I don't mean outer space, I mean space like when I get emails like this, uh, actually Karen, I don't know if she's here today, but she's, you know, I get emails like this that say, uh, Dr. Mason, some hard drives are coming your way. Please validate this in two weeks. And you know, we, we've uh, learned quickly how to validate genomes. We had no idea how to necessarily even interpret a genome, but we had to now validate a genome very quickly. So that's doing a lot with some computational biology tricks to just make sure the files are okay. Uh, but as we started building up uh, hard drives, my desk started to look like this, you know, so we have hard drive, hard drive, hard drive. And when you get one hard drive, you think, well, I'll just deal with that later. I'll copy that up on the cluster and then I'll deal with it later. But then it got a little bit unwieldy pretty quickly. Um, and we started just, you know, thinking, doing a little thought experiment. So eventually at the end of this, we're going to have somewhere near 1,000 genomes at the end of this R01. So we think, well, uh, well, you know, that's about 100 terabytes, because essentially we have about 100 gigs per genome. It's 100 terabytes. Okay, that's, that's pretty big. But what if we just, you know, scaled it up bigger? What if we did, like, whole genome sequencing uh, for all babies this year, about 4.3 million genomes, so it's 430 petabytes. What if we did it for everyone over 40 this year? It'd be about 100, 100 million genomes uh, or about 10 exabytes. So that's, that's, you know, it's getting pretty big as well. Okay, all right, everyone in China, 1.3 billion genomes, 130 exabytes. That's also getting kind of unwieldy. Uh, but what if we just had 10 billion genomes with 10 time points each? So say every time you go to the doctor, you're gonna get your genome sequence, right? So who's gonna keep that data? Where's that gonna go? We're looking at 10 zettabytes. I'd say, which is big, but it could, get, it could get bigger because that's just the genome. That's just your DNA in a sorted BAM file. So if you have your genome with all your structural variants, all your, you know, essentially your indels as well, uh, single nucleotide changes, you have your transcriptome with all the complexities I just described as well as the epitranscriptome. You have the epigenome as well, the histone DNA changes. You have then uh, essentially everything goes, their uh, data that you could start to integrate, like the gene regulation effects, nucleosome changes. Uh, RNA editing changes. You could look at the proteome. You could look at the metabolome. You could look at how those start to interact with each other. You have to keep track of everything that's ever been seen before in any other database, as well as family medical history. You also look at every bacteria and fungi growing in and on you, of which they outnumber you in your body. Uh, the viruses growing in and on you that make up also part of your genome, as well as every drug, vitamin, and hormone you're taking. And eventually, uh, and I'll remind you again that you're outnumbered in your body in terms of bacterial to normal cells. We can't forget about um, you know, those genomes as well. And if you do this over time and compare this to the environment, it won't be too long, I think, before you get to a yodabyte, which is a really crazy sized number, which would force you to move everyone out of Delaware and Rhode Island to make space for all the data centers that would have to store this data. And as some people pronounce it yetabyte, I prefer yodabyte is what I prefer, I'd say. And just as a quick reminder, there are only two options according to Yoda. There's do or do not. There is no try. So if we try to just do this, if we just try to do this, we say, all right, let's buy the space. It's $100 for a terabyte. That's pretty cheap these days. So that's fine. One yodabyte is about a trillion terabytes. So that's, I need $100 trillion is all I would need which is actually more than the amount of money in the entire world, if you look at just the world's GDP. So you couldn't even buy a Yoda byte today if you wanted to. So this forces us to think a little bit carefully about how we store data and being more clever about it. Uh, and you know, the most common uh, response I get is, okay, well, Chris, you're crazy. Let's just keep only those areas with mutations. We don't need all the reference alleles, uh, although Elliot Margulies, you know, would d disagree. There's, you, know, you need to have some evidence of what is actually there, whether you, whether you truly had no evidence of a mutation. So in, in this, to this question, I would just say, uh, no, that's very simple. So the reason is for anything with a per base, per allele information, that's the only way you're gonna be able to look at heterogeneous cells as I've described today, or really complex samples where you don't just have one cell with one mutation, but you have, as we've described, and also Elaine Martis and Ding and other colleagues have published and looked at, you have this change, you have this evolution of cancers that do occur and, and continuously occur, and they actually can help inform how you'll treat therapy. So if you know there's a small presence of one little bit of allele that's actually present that you think might be indicative of chemo resistance, you wanna know that it's not just yes or no present of a mutation, but is there any evidence of mutation whatsoever at that time point? So I think this uh, is something we can't forget. And so in the last, I guess, five minutes, my sort of personal perspective on what we're doing with all this uh, data and, and I, I, what we're thinking about it, as it gets down to the word savoring, I'd say. So there's a lot of groups uh, which I'm involved in, lots of you in this room as well, looking at sort of genome standards or how do we use this data, vario human variome project, and how we aggregate all these data. There's a lot of companies that will claim to just take your data and interpret your genome. 
uh, which is interesting because they don't actually always agree, I've found. And there's a lot of cloud-based approaches, a lot of work being done to try and put all of the data into cloud-based systems or protected data clouds, which is uh, coming along not as fast as I'd like, but it's coming. And also there's this interesting blossoming of patient and data sharing initiatives from the patients themselves. Uh, this is something that's really unprecedented until the last five or six years. Uh, but you know, do you need a $100,000 interpretation for a $1,000 genome? Well, first, there probably is no $1,000 genome, uh, and I'm getting, I'm getting evidence that won't happen in the, in, in, yet in the next six months or two years. Or Jay Flatley said 2014. I think I heard saw that in some news article. So whenever this would occur, if and when this occurs, uh, you know, you, we need all this money. I think you know, maybe a big phone bill. You just need like you pull out your nerd power, I think, is what you say. Is just say, you, can, you um, get to start to look at this data. Uh, and you can give it to you know, companies to have them look at your VCF file. But this is an example of this sort of democratization, you could say, of, of people and their genetic data and, and their information. This is actually from patient data uh, from Cornell Med, uh, where we actually have patients. You can log in and start to look at your own uh, lymphocyte counts. You can look at your, you know, every, every count of anything that's in your blood work. You can start to watch it track over time. And I've been emailing with a lot of people uh, as we work with some of the patients. And what do they think? And one of the uh, sort of striking moments I had by email is getting a back and forth with a patient saying, uh, that you know, technology has really enabled patients to have full access to their data, just like they should, is, is what he said. You know, he, he says, I get to monitor my body in ways I've never imagined for the rest of my life. Like this kind of a sense of uh, in, in, back and forth and information about your genome and your uh, sort of metabolomics. And you know, he says, I, I don't have a clue as to what it all means, actually. Uh, it's cool to be able to look at the trends. And for example, one thing he said is that when he had a high percentage of xenophils, he had very itchy skin. So you can actually have the molecular data start to inform your own perspective of your own body. And this is, you know, it's being done at Cornell Med in other places, um, and you will, you know, this is terror, essentially, that your, your genetic information will, um, will be used against you, and even though GINA was passed in 2008, uh, there's still concerns about long-term, uh, you know, insurance or other ways it could be, you know, so covertly used against you, and that we have seen from Yenev Ehrlich's work that, you know, you can identify the genomes, if you have just a little bit of extra information, you can just go on Facebook, you can use facial recognition software, you can combine all this information. You know, privacy is, is, is slowly waning, it seems. Uh, but some people, it's interesting to note that some people don't really seem to care. Now, some people are actually posting their, all their information on, and their picture of themselves on websites like Patients Like Me and saying, this is who I am, you know, this is, I have epilepsy, here's the drugs I'm taking, here's a longitudinal measure of my weight, of my mood, of everything I've taken, of everything that's happened to me medically, and you can mine this data and start to compare it to anyone who's taking that new drug, that new therapy, who has some of these same phenotypes. Everything's being sort of digitized, the sort of digitized self-movement, you know, is coming and is kind of here, I'd say. And it's, I think it represents a future of, you know, publicly personalized medicine. And for example, I could even tell you myself, I've had my genome sequence on Illumina, and you know, I, I'm even more sure that I shouldn't smoke given my risk for, say, lung cancer. Uh, I was already pretty sure, but now I definitely know. Uh, and you know, with just taking normal tools and saying, what am I most at risk for? Um, I'm not surprised, I guess, that I'm at risk for lots of cancers. I mean, I think we all are at some, on some level. And, you know, but uh, some of the, I think I've made it through some critical time periods where my risk for schizophrenia, in theory, has now waned, I think, but you know, it was, was alarming to see nonetheless. But you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to actually post uh, bits of my genetic information. Um, and it, I, you know, I think it has, uh, there is an ability to actually start to con you know, contribute to the greater good as a healthy control. I think this idea of sharing controls and being healthy and sharing that information will help also us understand disease better. So, in the longer term, what do we do with all these features, you know, these molecular features, these mutations, these epigenetic, epitranscriptomic changes? My uh, comparison is that, you know, we used to be looking here, essentially, but now we're looking everywhere. We used to be just looking where we had light, but now we're essentially like astronomers in the 1700s, 1800s. We're just trying to find what do we see when we look at the genome? What do we look at the sky of the genome? And what we're seeing is a lot of colors and things we don't quite understand. And, and changes, but what we eventually did for astronomy and for physics is we know now what the absorption and emission spectra are for every atom essentially in the entire periodic table. So when you look at a star, you look at anything far away, you can tell how photons are absorbed and re-emitted, and you know just by that signature exactly what presence of which atoms are actually there. So I think we're in this, this long period of maybe 10, 20, 30 years of actually having to collect all these data, and hopefully at some point we'll reach this stage as well. And so pathways will help, they can and do help, but you do always end up with hairballs. And so the closing remark I'd say is, you just have to think about, you know, what, what do you do with hairballs? So uh, some advice has come to me from the New York City subway system where they have these posters that look at, you know, different types of rock and roll, like say yacht rock, or arena rock, or you know, surf rock. I didn't know it was a type of rock and roll, but Amstel Light has posters that says you should just savor complexity, and they make hairballs on the subway. And so I think that's essentially what we're doing as well, is trying to collect it and then savor it, and that's my closing pitch. And with that, I'd like to uh, say you know, gratitude to uh, especially people in the lab, especially uh, Shun Lee, whose work I've presented a lot of here, and she does fantastic work, and a lot of other people uh, in the laboratory here, as well as a lot of great collaborators, 
and uh, especially Illumina for inviting me, and I'm happy to take questions. All right, do we have any questions for Dr. Mason? Questions? The, the, the slides are posted on my Twitter account if you want to download them, they're up there. <laughs> um, I have one question because I know that you are, are clearly not afraid, afraid of large data sets. No. Um, but I see that you, when you're looking at methylation, you're always doing reduced representation. Uh, How come? Is it a cost? Is it a technical? Is it a, because it, it can't be fear of data. No, no, it's a good question. So there is a, there is a whole, well, there's a, what, what there's a whole methylome bisulfide sequencing, or WMBS, or some people just call it WMS. But the, the only, it's mainly cost is the reason. We can just do more samples uh, you know, at the same cost, which clearly I don't shy away from that. I'm going to have the exome versus genome comparison. I always go towards the genome because I just prefer the thoroughness. But um, we've done a few comparisons of low coverage whole methylome versus RBS, and we feel like we get you know, the majority of the different changes overlap pretty strongly, 93, 95% of the changes, at least, but, but it's a biased data set because we, we, we know most of the changes based on RBS data. So um, it would be good to, in an ideal world, to just bisulfite treat all the DNA, get complete genome-wide uh, methylation changes. And um, I think it's just a, a cost issue, I'd say. And so, I mean, for most of those of you who don't do it, basically you have a reduced complexity genome. Instead of having th four bases everywhere, you have three bases. So you need a little bit more sequence depth to make sure you map everywhere, and longer reads help as well. But um, yeah, just call it. But I would, I would prefer always whole genome, whole methylome uh, sequence if possible, um, and sort of ribodepleted uh, RNA-seq if possible. Yes? I, I'm just curious how your uh, clinical colleagues react. Uh, you know, they're, they're struggling with the idea of, of mutations affecting tumors and such. When you talk to them about the, the epigenome and the layers beyond that, uh, what do they do? Uh, cry sometimes. <laughs> uh, they, the, no, I mean, there's this sense of, um, you know, so I like the, the complexity that's there. They, uh, and the, the, usually the response is, well, just, you know, I, I want something, something tangible, something concrete, or, you know, there's this often, there's this, you know, this, this real dichotomy of it kind of as a personality switch is on the receiver operator characteristic curve, there's always a sense of sensitivity or specificity. And I'm always on the sensitivity side. I'm always terrified I'm missing something. And other, generally the clinical uh, collaborators I have really just say, I want high specificity. I just want to make sure that I'm, that I'm right. I don't want to, I, I might be missing stuff, but I just need to make sure that this is right. Because if you're going to do a differential diagnosis or do anything that would actually treat someone, you can't spend all your life searching for every possible um, variation of something. You have to really just know what you're looking at. So, uh, you know, they, they um, no, they, they appreciate the complexity, but would but, um, say that my talks are like Rorschach plots and there's just a whole bunch of things happening and, and they... Um, uh, they think it's a little bit, you know, it, it's, it's not tractable yet. So I think uh, I'm comfortable with the, with the fact that we don't know what they all are yet, but if you try to apply that in a clinical setting, uh, it just goes in the bin, the, the, you know, the VOUS has been, it goes in the, we don't know what these are bin, so that's, that's where they'll stay for a while. Yeah, the variance of unknown significance for the, the germ. So I have a simple question. For your high gene expression and the hypermethylation, mm -hmm. do you think the methylation is necessarily playing a role in, in and what's the, the mechanism? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, it was interesting. Uh, there's, you know, there's a paper under review that we have that looks more at. We talked. I like to talk to Leo today about uh, methyl cytosine and uh, hypermethylation or hypomethylation. And we found that if you look at what's the correlation, say, of that, that change of methylation in gene expression, we actually see it's only about 0.6 of a Pearson correlation, maybe 0 0.5, 0 0.7. Uh, but what we found, and there's some, it's starting to come out in the literature and we see it as well, is actually hydroxyl methyl cytosine, which you can do basically tab-seq or you can do pull down sort of a click chemistry to look at hydroxyl methylcytosine. The, the correlation with gene expression there is much stronger, actually 0 0.8, 0 0.9. We actually see that uh, that's a much better mark of whether a gene goes uh, up or down. And, and as I indicated, there's, you know, if you, they, they seem to be uh, acting somewhat independently uh, that, you know, and across, not just at the transcriptional start site or just in the promoter, but we see a lot in the first intron or also even 5, 10 KB upstream. We see these significant changes, whereas we see nothing else anywhere in the gene, but that is the only thing that's associated with the change in gene expression. So, it's, um, it, you know, this is actually one of the big thrusts of the ENCODE project is to try and tease out what are some of the regulatory, you know, sort of factors that control it. Is it methylcytosine? Is it histone changes? Is it hydroxymethylcytosine? All those, you know, so it's still a bit of an, uh, a research question, but I can tell you already from our data that methylcytosine, um, you know, correlation is good, but it's actually not as good as hydroxymethylcytosine for, for controlling gene expression from what we can tell. And that the promoters, as just showed in the paper there, you know, promoters are fine, but I just, um, I don't like them as much as I used to. They're not as informative as I would like them to be. So, 
Uh, I, have an, I have a question. Um, presumably methylation controls gene expression, but then it sort of it becomes a chicken or egg thing, right? I mean, then what controls the methylation? I mean, do you, you, I guess eventually you have to integrate the mutational data along with, with the epigenetic data because I guess one hypothesis is that there are some mutations, presumably random mutations, then that drive the genes that methylate or demethylate uh, because otherwise, again, you're sort of in an end endless loop. You know, what, what eventually does cause these, these, these alterations? And, yeah. and there has to be a, a, a causative event, right? So how, how much are you sort of using the genetic data and mutation data to inform these changes? Right. I mean, right. Right. And what the, so, I mean, one example could be the isocitrate dehydrogenase gene, or the IDH, which, you know, we know is an epigenetic modifier, uh, or, or, you know, DNA methyltransferase is DNMTs and DNMT3A or 3B or DNMT1. We know that when we see mutations in those genes, we do see, you know, a lot of changes to the methyl, methylation states in front of genes. So we know that, you know, those are some of the, the proteins that definitely are controlling the, 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 the expression, or at least controlling the methylation. But the big question, it just reverts back, well, what's controlling them? And so we can see pretty clearly that when you have mutations in those genes, you'll see aberrant gene expression pretty quickly uh, and, and globally for, for those types of changes. So it's the DNMTs, the IDHs, I think, that are really the, the more controlling factors. Right. And, Good. I understand that in tumors, the general situation is that uh, tumor suppressors are hypermethylated and uh, tumor promoter genes are hypomethylated. Uh, do you see examples where that's not true? Maybe the, the, the reverse happens? Yes. Uh, there's a, I don't have it in this, these slides, but there's a, you know, if you just take a, a, a scatter plot of what do you see for a gene expression change in methylation, so you just have log full change of expression, you have um, percent methylation difference you'll see things on all, all quadrants. You'll see things where you have, you know, change in, you have complete hypermethylation, you'll have both increased and decreased expression. We see, you know, we see violations of that rule in, all over the genome. So, you know, while there is a trend that generally hypermethylation does turn off a gene in general, there are violations of that rule uh, everywhere. So it's actually, it led to a little bit of, you know, hand-wringing in the lab of like, well, what good is methylation anyway? So for a little while, we were all just upset about this. But, um, you know, you have, to also, you have to be careful how you look at the data, too. If you, if you just look at globally and just plot all the data, it will look a bit noisy. But if you only look at genes that have changed their expression and areas that have changed their methylation, that's when you get a better sort of tease out of the correlation. You can't just plot them in general. It's all the noise and all the signal together. So that, that is one thing we found that helps. But, but we do still see outliers where you, you'll see clear sort of viol violators of that, of that kind of rule. A lot of them, actually. Yeah. But it's complexity, so we savor it, I guess. Yeah.